Amen. Good evening, everyone. Amen. We thank God for his goodness and his mercy. And we thank God for allowing us to see another day. If you would, bow your head for a few moments of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you have blessed us to see. God, we ask you to look on us right now, each and every one that is present on Facebook, oh God. God, we ask you to word our mouths as we bring forth the word, oh God, your teaching word, oh God. Let this word be something that we can apply to our everyday lives. These and all other blessings we ask in your name, we just thank God. Amen and amen. Amen. We thank God for, uh, again, blessing us to see you another day, and we thank God for another Thursday night uh, Bible study teaching lesson. And our theme uh, that we have been focusing on for the past either four or five Thursdays is spiritual formation. It's time for change. In Romans 12 and 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and reprove what God's will is 
his good, pleasing, and perfect will, and then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And our other background scripture is Proverbs 4 and 23. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. A spiritual formation is an approach to every area of life. It is consciously chosen and sustained relationship between us and God, which we are consistently transformed in the image of God by following God's will and purpose for our life. And the subject that myself, I'm Elder Mark Sutton, and my partner on tonight is Minister Jim James Fitzgerald. Our subject that we have chosen for tonight is formed to be used by God. Can you trust God in the process? I don't know if uh, Brother Yancey, if you could type that on the uh, Facebook comments. Again, our subject on tonight is formed to be used by God. Can you trust God in the process? God is not only forming you for your own personal spiritual growth, and I think we have, uh, most of our presenter, presenters have talked about personal spiritual growth, but he's also forming you so that you can be used for his service. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected in Philippians 1 and 6 says be confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ so what God has started in you he will complete it he will form you into what he wants you to be the catch is if you allow him to do that form to be used by God can you trust God in the process. So tonight, myself and Minister Fitzgerald want to speak on a couple of well-noted Bible characters that were formed to be used by God. But before we go any further, there's a video titled, Trust the Process. Check out left. 
This might not even be your last time getting left. Pull yourself together and quit tripping because you're in the process. Could it be possible that God has allowed you to face and confront certain things so that he could use you to be a blessing in somebody else's life? Could it be possible that your destiny incorporates the place of your agony? That God wants to use you in the very area that you have had the greatest pain and the greatest turmoil? Could it be possible that the passion that is necessary to be effective is derived from a personal malady that gave you the deep well? I don't know this if anybody I've ever met who was greatly anointed and, and had a deep well through which they were able to change lives. They also had a deep experience which was the catalyst to give them the motivation to drive over all the obstacles that would deter you from destiny and give you the power to, as I like to say, take a licking and keep on ticking because you are driven by more than finances, more than money. You are driven by a personal experience and an encounter with God. God. Amen. As we can see in the video, and it's talking about the formation is not all about you, but it's also about you going through your process so that you can be a help to others. Amen. Go ahead, Yancey. Brother Yancey, go ahead and uh, continue the video. God is processing you. He ain't through with you. If he was through with you, you would not wake up in the morning. He's going to fix it. Everything is wrong. First of all, let me tell you this right here. Why are you tripping? I look back on my life and all that I've been through. So the stuff I'm currently going through, I have built up enough reservoir that living in the car taught me that this ain't it. So the things I'm going through now, I know this ain't it. That he gonna come get me in a minute. So all I gotta do is sit tight. I ain't in a bad place. Now I ain't where I wanna be, but the spot I'm in is better than where I was. I ain't homeless. So what I'm going through right now, y'all don't know, I got some challenges. People think when you get famous or rich that your problems is over. Oh, they got a whole new set of them for you. They got some stuff you ain't seen. Biggie wrote a song said one time, more, more, more money, more problems. I, I got to tell you something, that boy wasn't never lying. But the truth is that Hollywood's... Hey man, we have to be patient in going through the process, regardless how difficulty the steps are. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So there are steps that we have to take in going through the process. We can't skip the steps, because if we skip the steps, sometimes we have to go back and complete the steps. Amen. Go ahead and start it, Brother Yancey, at 750.
Amen. Trust in the process. And when he was talking about, Bishop Jakes was talking about giving his son the car keys at the age of five. If he would have done that, that would not have been a blessing to his son. Actually, it would have been a tragic thing if he would have done that. And it reminded me of the prodigal son, how he told him, you, we all know the story, he told his father, you know, give me what, what is due me, and I want to just go out and just live on my own. But how if he would have stayed and, be, and been nurtured by his father, then he would not have went out and did what he had done and spoiled all his good. So trust God in the process. Amen? So there are times God promises us certain, us certain things, and they, happen, and they happen right away. But there are other times when he promises us certain things, and he makes us wait. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. I want it right now. But during our waiting, God is preparing us or forming us so that we will be ready to receive his promise when the time comes. The question again is, will you trust God in the process? So when we look at the, the life of King David, uh, he was anointed king as Israel, of Israel, excuse me, at an early age, but he did not assume the position as king until years later. He accepted the anointing as God's promise and became king later following God's plan, though the plan was not revealed to him. And Brother Yancey, if you can put the scripture on the screen, 1 Samuel 15, 10 through 11. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. So Saul was disobedient, so he was not willing to be formed to be used by God. And so we look at uh, 1 Samuel, the uh, 16th chapter, chapter, God comes to Samuel and tells him, I rejected Saul as king. Go to the tribe of Jesse where I have chosen one of the sons to be king. So when Samuel gets there, Jesse goes through all seven sons, but the Lord says they are not the ones. Samuel asks Jesse, are there any more? And Jesse replies, there is one more, my youngest, who is tending the sheep. And Samuel asks Jesse to send for him. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. God was looking for a man after his own heart, a man that was willing to be formed to be used by God. Now, if this was a movie, we would assume that once David is anointed, he automatically assumes the, the throne as being king. But that's not so. According to the Bible, most scholars say that when David was anointed uh, as a king, he was at the age of 15. So the story stops. There's a break in the story. He was anointed but not yet appointed. The Bible says David went back to attending the sheep. Brother Yancey, if you would get 2 Samuel 5 and 4. So when you read that, it was not until 15 years later, at the age of 30, David began to reign as king. So the question is, what was going on through that 15 year period from the time he was anointed? And the answer is God was forming him and he was getting him ready to become king. So David was not ready to handle being king at the age of 15. So most of David's forming or training was not your typical classroom type sit in front of the teacher setting. It started out with David continue to, continuing to attend to the sheep, which ultimately would prepare him to be shepherd king of Israel. In 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, while attending the sheep, he became skillful in playing the harp, which caused him to be summoned to play for Saul and David's preparation for skillfully playing the harp opened up an opportunity 
to be in Saul's presence. In Second Sam, excuse me, First Samuel chapter seventeen, the Bible, excuse me, by David being in Saul's presence, this allowed him to testify to Saul that he killed both the lion and the bear. So this afforded David the opportunity to fight Goliath. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, by defeating Goliath, David becomes a leader in Saul's army. But however, David's training now takes on a different approach. Saul now becomes jealous because David is getting all the credit. You know, in the Bible says the chanting and the singing went on. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David now is on the run from the trainer, his trainer, Saul, who was trying to kill him. Amen. According to some Bible scholars, David hides in a cave for a period of eight years. So now he is all alone. So what looks like humiliation is actually a preparation for an acceleration to your destination. Let me repeat that again. What looks like humiliation, because I know David was probably humiliated, didn't know where God was taking him. What looks like humiliation is a preparation for an acceleration to your destination. So David turned his wilderness into a training ground and a place of worship. Can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah. So while in the cave, according to most Bible scholars, that's where David wrote most of the Psalms. And some of the Psalms that come to my mind, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. And he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. The Lord is my light. And he's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength. Oh, my life. Whom shall I be afraid when the wicked, even my enemies, he's talking about Saul, and my foes came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled. And fell, and though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing, everybody say one thing. One thing I have a desire of the Lord that I will seek after. He wasn't asking for a house. He wasn't asking for a car. But he wanted to be in God's presence. That I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Why? For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his palace, of his tabernacle. And he shall hide me and he shall set me upon a rock. The Lord is my refuge and he's my strength. And he's a very present help in the time of trouble. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. How many remember the movie, The Karate Kid? And it, uh, Daniel gets, uh, beat, he gets beat up by a group of guys that were in a karate club. And so he meets this maintenance man, Mr. Miyagi. And uh, Mr. Miyagi enters Daniel, Daniel into a karate tournament. So the agreement is made, if Daniel wins the karate tournament, the guys will leave Daniel alone. If Daniel loses, then it will be open season on Daniel. So Mr. Miyagi offers to teach Daniel karate. And so Daniel was all excited about learning karate. So on the first day, Mr. Miyagi tells Daniel to wax all the cars. Wax on, wax off. Then on the second day, Mr. Miyagi tells Daniel to sand the floor. Then on the third day, he tells Daniel to paint the fence. 
So he's an up and down motion with the, with the wrist. And finally he tells Daniel to paint the house. Sideways motion. So for each chore, Daniel is using a specific hand motion. So after weeks of doing this, Daniel's thinking, this man has only got me over here just to do his chores. So Daniel gets upset and he wants to quit. He's not learning anything about karate. So Mr. Miyagi takes him through a little exercise. And so Daniel's able to defend every strike that Mr. Miyagi is throwing at him. So had he had not stuck with that awkward training, and sometimes when we're going through our process, we don't know the mind of God. What, he's ha what he has for us, but we have to stick to the process, regardless of how difficult or how hard it is. We got to stick to the process. Amen? Amen? So in my conclusion, David accepted the anointing as God's promise of becoming king. There was no information on how or when he would become king, but he understood that he would have to follow God's schedule. Even though it was not revealed to him, you may have you may have to experience many difficult situations during your process, but trust God through it all. And he will give you, according to Jeremiah 29 11, a great expected end. Form to be used by God. Trust God in the process. Let's say amen for Minister Fitzgerald as he comes. Praise God for uh, Elder Sutton's uh, message tonight. Um, it's just a blessing. Um, everything he said definitely was true. And the process that, when we look at the process, sometimes it's awkward, very awkward and unexpected. And the action and the activities that you have to go through or that takes place may not be what you want, but the, nevertheless, we have to stick to it. Um, as we look at the theme which, uh, of the month um, of August, it was Reformation, which means to change or make a change. And as stated by Elder, Elder Sutton, our subject is formed to be used by God. Can you trust God? The process. I want to share a couple of scriptures in um, Romans 6.23 and also Romans 3.23 and 24. And I don't want to dwell on uh, sin, but I, I, in talking about the two characters, which I'll get to, I want to take a look at these scriptures. Uh, Romans 6.23 states, for the wedges of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus, our Lord. Romans 3.23 states that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. With that said, I want us to take a look at two characters in the Bible, one was the Samaritan woman, and the other is Paul, the apostle. A lot of times when we look at people or the process, we want to think about, well, how can that person be used? They're nothing. Just an old sinner and nothing. Nothing at all. Then we look at somebody like Paul, who was very intelligent, very smart, Hebrews of Hebrews, I mean, Jews of Jews, and we think in terms of him as being 
the man. But when you look at things through a natural eye, you miss a whole lot. But when you perceive things through the spiritual, you see a totally different picture. The Lord put this on my mind and my heart because God does not look at man the way we look at him or we look at ourselves. But what he looks at us is from the end, he sees the result of you. He sees the destiny of you. And I want to say praise God to the listening audience. Those of you that are tuned in, you tuned in for a purpose. You may not even know why you tuned in, but you're here for a purpose. And God, through you tuning in, is putting you on your route or on your journey for re reformation. Now, when we look at the process of reformation, as my partner, Brother Mark, has said, it's not easy. And it may not even be wanted. But if you want to be with God, and if you want to follow him, you must go through the process. There is no easy, this is no easy journey. And God has not promised that it would be. He's not promised that it would be. But we have to go through this process. Now, one of the things that I want to remind us of is that God loves us before the process. In the state that you're in now, in the state that I'm in right now in the state that our listening audience is in, whoever you are, as I said, you tuned in for a reason. And we pray tonight that you receive what you tuned in for that will start you on your journey, your Reformation journey, so you can be who and what God wants you to be. It does not happen overnight. It's a process. And the more, the older I get, I realize that the process is tedious. It doesn't get easier. It doesn't get easier because Satan would love to take me out in an old age. He would love it. But I'm not going to let it happen if the Lord helps me. It's not going to happen. No. I did not live this long to go to hell. I haven't stayed single long, this long, to go to hell. It ain't happening. It's not happening. So I just want to let you know that. First of all, sin is sin regardless who commits it. Commits it. There is no little sins and there is no big sins. It is just sin. Whether you tell a lie, commit adultery, etc., or tell or treat your neighbor wrong, it's still sin. But God loves us despite what we've done, what we may be doing. God loves loves us in spite of. That's why we're on the Reformation process. Now, when we look at the the Samaritan woman, she, there was no dealings between the Jews and the Samaritans. You want to know why? Simply because of who they married. Non-Jewish people marrying Jewish people named Samaritans were considered less than. They were viewed as dogs. And the Jewish community did not have anything to do with them. I want you to let that sink in. But my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did not make a difference. Because as he was on his journey, 
He said in the word, and I want to take a look at four, uh, uh, four uh, twenty six in the scripture. I think I, didn't, I don't think I put the scripture down on this one. I think I gave it to you, Nancy. Uh, Nancy. Do you have that? John, I'm sorry. He went through Samaria, which is called to a place uh, or city called Samaria, which is called Sachar, near to the parcel of, of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, uh, Jacob's well was there. And Jacob's well is where the, uh, the Samaritans went to get water. And the problem was that the Samaritan woman, when she went to get water, they, were, they tried to go when it wasn't a lot of people because of the way they would be treated. But Jesus said, I must go to Samaria. Now you think about that. Here, here this woman is. Here he's on a journey. But yet, he's mindful of her. A Samaritan. So he went to the well, tired and weary, and sit down. On the well. And about the sixth hour, the Samaritan woman appeared. She came to the well. And the lesson talks about then come, cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sachar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, jo Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, set thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There came a, Samar a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, give me to drink. Now, as far as the Samaritan woman was concerned, it was natural water that he wanted to drink. And so, then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and would, he would have given thee living water. So as we look at this story, we find that Jesus is not saying to her to give me to drink for the sake of natural water. But he was using that particular situation to tell her about the living water, which he was, the living water. So in this process, in, this, in her reformation process, not only did Jesus ask her, did she want living water? And she said, yes, give me this water, when he explained to her what the water was all about. And he asked her to go and fetch or get her husband. And she told him that she had no husband. And he said, said, you said it well. Not only have you said no husband, you've had five. And the one that you're with now is not yours. He read her mail. Specifically, correctly, and down to the last end of it. But the thing that I, what caught me and stayed on my mind was the fact that it wasn't necessarily the sin, so to speak. It was what he wanted to do for her. It was what he wanted to do for her. Get her out of that situation. Tell her about what she's doing. 
then offer her the living water. And she was evidently ready for the living water. Because if, he had, if she wasn't, he, he wouldn't have went by there. But it was something about her that he wanted her to know. And it was about him and the fact that she needed change and that she was being, she was on, he was putting her on the reform, reformation journey. How did he put her on the reformation journey? But telling her using the subject sin. Talking about what she had done. Letting that sink into her brain, to her mind, to realize what she'd done. And she doesn't have to do that anymore. So when he told her about her life, what did she do? She dropped the bucket and ran and told the other men, the scripture says men, ab about a man that knew all that she had done. And as a result of that, as you read, these scriptures, you will find that the end, the end result, not only was she changed on her process or journey, but other Samaritans got on the journey as well. So much so until they wanted Jesus to be with them for a while. They were convinced that he was the son of God. Not because she said it. Because they said that they perceive of themselves who he was. And they were on the Reformation journey. Based on something that the Samaritan woman had done. So it wasn't necessarily all about the sin, but it was a, the sin was a transporter, a vehicle for Jesus to tell her about herself and get her to change her lifestyle. Those of us that are walking around here thinking that we are all right, I want to let you know tonight, God can read your mail. He can read mine, he can read yours, but yet he can change you and the process, put you on the process, on the journey for a better life with him. I want to talk now about Paul. Paul was an apostle. But prior to that, Paul was a prosecutor, I'm not a prosecutor, a persecutor of Christians. People that loved God, he persecuted them to the point that he wanted to find as many as he could anywhere he could and imprison them if they were, if they were what he called in the way, meaning following Christ meaning a Christian, he wanted to get rid of you. But God had another plan for Paul. And this is what I like about when I read about Jesus. He doesn't necessarily look at you, as I said before, where you are right now. He don't care if you're a liar. He don't care if you're a cheat. He don't care if you're a backbiter. He don't care if you're a troublemaker because he knows the end in the process and you're going to be that way until he gets time, gets ready for you to change. That's the great thing about God. He said he doesn't want any to be lost. He loves us all and wants us to change. Having self-esteem problems, having issues, God can change that. I don't normally share things, but I am going to share this. When I was young, I had such a self-esteem problem until I wouldn't even talk. 
Smart in school, but if you said something to me, I just wouldn't say anything at all because I was afraid that you were going to say something about me because I was so thin. I was very skinny, and uh, it, it just it affected me really bad. But one thing I can tell you is over the years, God has blessed me. He really has. And I could do just about anything, learn just about anything, but I, I couldn't, I just, it was hard for me. But I want to, I want to say this because God is a God that knows you and knows you where you are. He can change anything about you and the situation that you find yourself in or even when you don't know you're in a situation. So when I look at Saul, who was, I read this and I got to thinking about it, and I said, this man is doing this to these people. He thinks it's the right thing to do. He thought it was the right thing to do until he had that experience on Damascus Road. And this is Acts 1 through 31. Saul was on his journey. He was traveling to persecute the Christians. And a light shone. Some people say, oh, it was just a full moon. Yeah, I've heard that. It was no full moon. It was God getting his attention. Amen. You that are out there listening on Facebook, I want you to understand God sees and knows all. And there he has a timing to put an end to situations. And this was Paul's time because he knew what he wanted Paul to be. He was no longer going to be a persecutor, but he was going to be a man of God. He wrote a lot of epistles, and he also taught a lot. But he had to go through the Reformation process. His process was different from anyone else's process in the sense that God struck him blind for several days. And then you'll find in these scriptures that Paul prayed and God sent Ananias. And when he sent Ananias, the purpose of Ananias was to put his hand on his eyes so he could see and the scales fell off. When the scales fell off, Saul wasn't Saul anymore, but he was Paul and he began preaching immediately. I want you to know something this evening that the scripture is true. And what God says he will do, he can do. And he will do. He never fails us and he never lets us down. So those of you that are listening tonight, I want you to know that God is looking at you. He knows you. He has got your heart right now because you're tuned in. If he didn't, you wouldn't be tuned in. But you're tuned in because God is having you to do it. He's working with your heart tonight. He's working with your mind tonight to change you into who he wants you to be. God changed everything. But anyway, I just want to tell you tonight that when we look at the word of God, we cannot look at it naturally. And I know we know that. But for me, I'm beginning to see it totally differently 
and you can see it when you see it from the spiritual realm, God has more in the scripture than what we think. Because it's directed to your situation, my situation, and anyone else that's going through something or may go through something. Or may go through something. Because he does not want us to be lost. I associated that not being lost with these two characters. Because when you look at the Samaritan woman and her lifestyle and you look at Paul and what he was doing and God loved them when he was persecuting his own people, it just shows you the love of God for mankind and for his people. And he does not worry about what you're doing now. So what if you've been, if you stole before? So what if you've lied before? So what if you drank? So what? God has a plan for you. This concludes my thoughts that the Lord gave me. But I want to say to those that are listening, why did you tune in? Could it be that you want to change your life? Could it be that you feel unhappy or alone or trapped or that you know you need Jesus? Why did you tune in? Could it be that you want to come back to Christ and church after days, weeks, months, and years of unhappiness? <laughs> I'm telling you what I know. <laughs> Looking at my pastor telling you what I know. I want to let you know you've tuned in to the right place. You've tuned in to the right place because here at Refreshing Springs, we do have a pastor that will teach you the word, unadulterated word. And not only that, he loves you despite, not that he's Jesus Christ, but he loves you in spite of what you've done, how you've done it, what you've said, he loves you regardless. And I praise God for that. I want to say to you at this time, we are providing space for you. To those of you that watch Facebook or others' form of media, if you want to confess your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior by the raising of your hands and repeating after me 1 John 1 through 9 I'm sorry 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why I say, yes, we all have sinned sin and come short of the glory of God, but if we confess our sins, you, saw, you start a new slate with him. So let us repeat this portion as well, and then we're going to close. Lord, I confess my sins to you. Please forgive me of my sins. And cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I accept you as my personal savior. If you've taken the time to repeat these scripture and mean it from your heart, you are saved. And you're on your reformation journey. Is it going to be easy? No. Is it going to be a blessing? Yes. Are you going to be happy? Yes. Are you going to be sad at sometimes? Yes. But I guarantee you, if you come here, you'll be happy more than you are sad, especially on Sunday morning. God bless and have a great night.